Now we come to a third view on principal component analysis, and this time we adopt a probabilistic viewpoint on latent variable modeling. Now remember that in video 10.1 I talked about probabilistic latent variables and then discussed that the Gaussian mixture model was a probabilistic version of the discrete latent variable model obtained by k-means clustering. Now in this video we do something similar and approach principal component analysis, uh, which isn't necessarily considered a probabilistic approach, from the perspective of continuous latent variable models. Okay, now we, now we do this because probabilistic models have some uh, advantages over discriminative uh, models, right? Uh, because they allow to generate new data points once we have obtained a full uh, description of our distribution. And it allows us to deal with uncertainties. Now the approach that we're going to take is that we're going to uh, define a probabilistic latent variable model. And of course, again, once we have such a probabilistic model, we can optimize it via uh, the maximum likelihood. And as we will see, this gives us uh, a, a third alternative view on a principal component analysis. And in our modeling choices, we're choosing to work exclusively with, with Gaussian uh, variables because that keeps uh, things simple, uh, essentially. Now the setting is as follows. Uh, we're dealing with all these data points, uh, these, all these xn's, and each xn is a d-dimensional vector. And now our objective is to come up with a generative model. So we want to really model this full probability distributions, uh, which we can then use to generate new data points. So suppose all these uh, blue dots are my measurements. I want to recover the distribution that uh, generated uh, these measurements. And my assumption is going to be that intrinsically each data point really came from a lower dimensional distribution. So in this example, again, uh, my data points are 2D, for example, but it came from a one dimensional uh, latent uh, variable. So similar to the discrete uh, latent variable models, we assume that each data point actually has an associated uh, latent variable uh, value. And we're going to marginalize over this latent variable. So this is what we're going to model. So this joint distribution of X together with its uh, latent variable representation, but we are going to marginalize out this latent variable. And that gives us in the end a probability distribution for X only. And that's indicated on the right figure. So the idea is that intrinsically my data point came from this, this latent uh, distribution with some probability. And then once I have drawn such a uh, set, then this gives me a probability for making a particular observation for X, right? And this probability is modeled by this well, conditional probability. So given Z, what would be the probability for observing a particular X? And we're going to also model this, right? So we assume that there exists such a system, such a model that maps my latent variable to its true, um, let's say, value in observation space. But, but of course, there will be uh, uncertainty associated with this, uh, meaning that I'm not observing my, my, uh, my true observation, essentially, or my true data point. But uh, because of measurement noise, it may lie somewhere in this vicinity uh, according to some probability that's indicated with these red lines. So let me turn that into a density. So let's say darker means a higher probability. So this uncertainty will be incorporated in, in my uh, conditional uh, probability distribution, which we are going to model, right? So the generative process is then as follows. So we draw intrinsically my point came from this, this latent uh, representation, which is mapped uh, through some point in my um, observation space, but there's noise associated to it. So it's not perfectly on this line. So maybe this generated this data point. And then I observe the next uh, point that's somewhere over here, which leads to a point that's say somewhere over here. So we have this mapping from latent variable to my actual observation. And so for each latent variable, I have some probability of observing a particular uh, corresponding X. So that, that's these gray regions, right? With higher probability means a darker region. I'm going to observe a point in this region. So um, because we model this uh, prior probability to be also a Gaussian, we observe most points close to this, this mean over here, right? Um, so most observations will be somewhere uh, on the center of, of this, this line um, with some uncertainty again associated with it. So if I do this and place such a uh, uncertainty distribution around each point, yeah, I get this very uh, dense region. And if I draw the level sets of this. So really the level set of the sum of all these possible uh, distributions, I obtain my final um, 
generative model uh, p of x right via this so i overlapped all these densities and that was essentially the marginalization process uh, which i was doing by hand okay so i feel like i've sort of messed up this figure so maybe it's time to move on to uh, formulas again um so this is what my generative model looks like, right, right so we have this latent variable which is mapped to this higher dimensional space via some uh, linear model W. So this is going to be part of my uh, modeling assumption. So we're going to model this linear map at W together with this uh, bias mu. So this is really our, uh, let's say, forward model from the latent variable to my observation. And then there's noise associated with each uh, observation. And so we're going to make the following modeling choice that my uh, continuous latent variable will be Gaussian distributed. So basically my latent variable will have most likely its value close to zero, but there's a spread around it, right? So I'm going to model this prior from my latent um, to be Gaussian distributed. Okay, so this Z is a random variable coming from a, a Gaussian distribution. And then we have our uh, forward model. So basically this part um, of which its main component is this matrix W, right? So there's a D by M uh, dimensional matrix because my uh, latent variables were M dimension. So this matrix turns this M dimensional vector into a D dimensional vector. And then we have this uh, offset component. And then we have this other random variable, which is also assumed to be uh, Gaussian distributed. All right, so that really models my uh, generative uh, model. And since all these random variables are Gaussian distributed. So we have a Gaussian prior and a, we have Gaussian noise. It turns out that my um, conditional model for X given this Z and this noise actually is also going to be a Gaussian distribution. So this is also Gaussian. So when we talk about these conditional distributions, we fix a particular Z and then talk about the probability of observing a particular X. So we assume that we have sampled a particular Z and then we're going to think about the probability of observing this uh, particular X. And that is then described by my forward model. So my point will be centered around the point to which my linear model uh, maps it to. And then the only uncertainty is uh, due to the contribution of this noise, which is going to be isotropic in this d-dimensional space with some uh, sigma uh, squared uh, variance. So that tells me that my conditional distribution for observing X given Z will be also Gaussian distributed. Okay, and then we have uh, all the components in place, right? So we have a, a prior, which is Gaussian. We have a conditional, which is also Gaussian. And then this marginal, uh, which is given by this marginalization over Z of the product of my conditional with the prior will also be Gaussian. Okay, so this is also going to be a Gaussian and we rely on the results of chapter 2.3 in the book of Bishop. But this probability distribution is essentially an, a Gaussian with some mean, which I do not know yet, and also some uh, variance, some covariance. And actually you can derive this using the rules in this chapter, but it's kind of a tedious task. So we're approaching this now from a diff different uh, approach. So the idea is that I'm just going to rely on the fact that my output, my marginal, is going to be a Gaussian. So it has some uh, mean given by the expected value of my random variable and the covariance given well by the covariance of this random variable. And because we know what the forward process uh, looks like, we know what the generative process looks like, we can actually compute the expectation and the covariance of this random variable. So that's what we're going to do. So if we compute the expectation of X, it will give us the mean of this uh, Gaussian distribution. All right, so we have to compute the expectation of this uh, forward model where Z is a random variable and Epsilon is a random variable. Uh, due to linearity, I can move this W outside and I can split this into these separate expectations. Um, the expectation of a co constant is the constant itself. And we know that the expectation of Z is going to be zero because that's our uh, modeling assumption and also the expectation of my noise is also going to be zero. So this is zero. So that tells me that the expectation of X is going to be given my mu. So we have found the mean of my uh, Gaussian distribution. Okay, now what about the covariance matrix of our Gaussian distribution? Let's also just compute this, right? So uh, we start off with the definition of the covariance matrix that is given as follows, right? So my uh, random variable relative to its mean uh, squared and the expectation of this thing. Uh, 
Okay, now in this step, we just plug in our forward model. So X was given by W Z plus mu plus epsilon. And these uh, mu terms here cancel out. So if I just fill it in, I get the following expression. Uh, the next step is that we simply expand this uh, square. We expand this and that gives me the following. Then we use uh, linearity. So the expectation of the sum can be split in these separate expectations. So that's what we do over here. We use linearity. And then also this we can compute, right? So if we, uh, this can be derived from the covariance of my noise. So the covariance of epsilon is given by the expectation of epsilon, epsilon transpose plus the expectation epsilon expectation of epsilon transpose. And this has to equal sigma squared I, right? Because that was our uh, modeling, that, that was our model. We said that my uh, noise was Gaussian distribution with this covariance matrix. And also we know that the expectation of my noise is zero. So that's zero mean. So this tells me that this particular term is given by sigma squared I. So that's basically given by this uh, short derivation over here. In a similar way, we uh, derive that the expectation of set set transpose is going to be the identity matrix because, well, we said that my latent variable was also Gaussian distribution with unit uh, covariance matrix. Okay, so that's uh, that. And then for this particular term, we can actually, it, it follows that this has to be zero. And that's actually given as follows. So my random variable set and epsilon are independent. So the covariance of a set with epsilon is going to be zero. And this covariance is given by set epsilon transpose minus expectation of set, expectation of epsilon transpose. And because they are independent, this has to equal zero. And we know that, well, the expectations of these individual random variables is zero. So that tells me that the expectation of set epsilon transpose is also going to be zero. Okay, so this short derivation shows that this component is going to be zero. And that results in the following, that the covariance matrix of X is given by W, W transpose plus sigma squared I, and we're going to call this C, the covariance of my random variable X. Okay, and therefore we found that my marginal distribution which was going to be a Gaussian as its mean given by mu and its covariance matrix uh, given by C as we have just derived. Okay, so we just arrived at my final marginal distribution which describes all my observed uh, data points essentially is given by uh, this, uh, by this uh, Gaussian distribution with a particular mu and covariance matrix. And we got there by making the following modeling assumptions that we had this, this uh, prior on my latent variable, so we said it was Gaussian distributed. And then we have this forward model or this uh, conditional probability that once I have observed the Z, what would be the uh, probability of observing a particular X? And we model this uh, conditional probability to be also Gaussian distributed, where this was really my linear, uh, let's say forward model from a, really a fixed point Z to a fixed point on my true blue uh, observation uh, line essentially, but then there was noise associated to it uh, that's given by this uh, isotropic uh, covariance matrix. Okay, and then these two modeling choices together gave me my final marginal distribution, which was also uh, a Gaussian. So the point now is we have such a probabilistic model for X and that means uh, it still depends on my model parameters mu, w and sigma squared, right? So these are model parameters. I haven't give them a particular value yet. But now we can choose these values based on maximum likelihood, right? Because now we have this uh, probabilistic model that could describe my data point. So we can also test for how likely it is that uh, my model with these sets of parameters actually describe my, my, my data points. So we're going to optimize my model parameters uh, via the, the maximum uh, likelihood, the log likelihood approach. And well, we, again, as I said, we're dealing with Gaussians and these Gaussians, we can take the log of them. So it gives me these uh, front factors and it gives me the, the, the thing that was inside the exponent. So when we optimize this, 
Again, the recipe is take the derivative with respect to the thing that you optimize, set it to zero, and then solve for the particular parameter of interest. And if we do this for the mean, for example, then we take the derivative of my log likelihood with respect to mu that gives me this particular thing. And when we solve it, so we set it to zero and we solve it from mu, we obtain uh, the following expressions. So we have done these type of derivations many times uh, already, right? And not completely unsurprisingly, uh, the mean mu is going to be given by uh, my sample mean. And now while this recipe is, is kind of simple, right? Uh, the actual computation, the actual uh, way of deriving these w's and sigma squares is actually a really tedious task. And I'm not going to do this. Uh, actually, it's really hard. But the point is we can do this and we can find closed form solutions for my parameter mu, sigma squared and w. And I've uh, listed them here as follows. So I'm not going to do this derivation, but we can again uh, try to get some intuition at what we're looking at here. So we had our uh, data distribution and we assumed it to be uh, modeled via some, some Gaussian. So let me indicate this as follows. So this is then the covariance matrix that basically describes the shape of my uh, distribution. And the shape of this Gaussian was then given by C is W, W transpose plus sigma squared I. And this really came from our modeling choices, right? That we said we had this such a forward model and we have isotropic noise. And to get a bit of intuition, and I hope it helps, uh, we're going to think about this, this covariance that we try to uh, model. And the idea is as follows. So we're going to assume that our true, so our co observed covariance, so we have variation because my uh, latent variable uh, varies, but we also have variation uh, that comes from the fact that I have observation or measurement noise. So I'm going to say that my observed covariance of my data points, so these blue data points, is, is a combination of my true covariance uh, associated to my latent variable uh, variance and let's say some noise uh, covariance matrix. And then we saw in the previous videos that such covariance matrix, uh, when we think about these uh, projection spaces or these uh, basis functions, UM, so really the eigenvectors, and these were the eigenvalues of my covariance matrix. So we can make this, we can make this decomposition of S, right? Then in terms of this eigen decomposition, we can also split this into a part uh, given by, well, the, the, the largest set of eigenvectors plus the part that corresponds to the set of uh, smallest eigenvectors uh, and eigenvalues. And uh, that's going to be indicated with this uh, minus sign over here. So whatever the interpretation we give to this uh, covariance matrix, um, in terms of such an eigen decomposition, we can always make this splitting because my individual eigenvectors are all orthonormal. So I can split this matrix in, in the following way. Now, similarly as done before, I'm going to assume that uh, the covariance of the noise is going to be captured by the, uh, the principal components with the smallest eigenvalues. And likewise, I'm going to assume that uh, the, covari like the true covariance that actually came from the variations in my latent variables is going to, describe, is going to be described by the, the eigenvectors with the largest eigenvalues, so the main principal components. Okay, so that's step one, where we're making the splitting of my observed covariance, so this uh, capital S, into something that relates to the true covariance of my uh, latent variable model and some noise, measurement noise. Then we know that my probabilistic model, uh, so this uh, P of X, had a covariance matrix C, and this covariance matrix uh, was given as follows. So we're really building this Gaussian model with the following covariance matrix determined by my W uh, parameters and my uh, sigma squared, my noise uh, parameter. And our objective is of course that this covariance matrix of my model should represent uh, the true covariance. I'm not interested in, in modeling this noise. So my objective is that this covariance should match my true covariance. So that's the third step of this logic. So C should match as true. So if you fill this in, that gives you the following, right? So that U, M. Okay, so if we then solve this for W, let's move this sigma squared I uh, to the other side, then actually the identity, because my matrices are uh, orthonormal, these U, M's, so I could also multiply my I on the left and right with this uh, U, M. It's still the same thing. 
Okay, so if I rewrite this, so I move everything to the other side. So I have u m lambda m plus sigma squared i u m transpose. Okay, so that was really the third step in this logic. So if I now um, solve for w, I get this particular expression, right? So again, the idea was that I'm observing this uh, distribution of data points um, with some measured covariance, but then we said this covariance is composed of a true component and uh, let's say this uh, noise component. And this noise component, we're modeling with sigma squared i. So if we are going to model my uh, true covariance, then I have to set my w in such a way that I take into account this noise uh, parameter because uh, my model takes into account, my sigma squared takes into account this additional uh, variance. So that's, that sort of explains this, this uh, subtraction uh, over here. Okay, so really in this approach, I'm splitting my covariance into these uh, independent uh, components, right? And it nicely turns out, so what I'm doing here is not really a full rigorous proof, but I'm trying to stick with some intuition here. But it turns out that if you really compute the variation, so the sigma squared parameter by this maximum uh, likelihood approach, then it turns out that the sigma squared is really the average of the discarded, discarded variance. Right, because these lambdas, these lambda really describe the variance along my uh, directions encoded in these, these eigenvectors. And the m plus one uh, dimensions are basically discarded. So that's sort of summarized in this uh, sigma squared, which describes this isotropic uh, covariance. Okay, so that's a lot of talk about this probabilistic model, but the main point is that we are able to derive closed form expressions for my model parameters, so mu, sigma squared, and w. And they found in such a way that my probabilistic model in the end uh, is going to match my true uh, covariance. And then I have this modeling choice, right? How to pick M. If I pick M very low, that means basically I assume a lot of noise uh, because then these components become large. I start summing over a lot of discarded covariance matrix. So I assume a lot of noise, meaning I assume a lot of noise in my measured data. So really I expect my true data to be highly concentrated and all the rest is noise. And the other way around, if I trust my data a lot, then I'm not discarding too many um, principal direction. So this sigma squared will become small and then my uh, estimated distribution is nicely approximated my true measured uh, distribution. Okay, so we just covered principle, uh, probabilistic principle component analysis and it really provides a probabilistic generative version of principle component analysis, which we can also use to draw samples from it. So with this probabilistic principle component analysis, uh, we end up with Gaussian distributions with the number of parameters really restricted uh, essentially by the, by the latent space. So this is essentially a modeling choice. So I say my latent space consists of M components and this really restricts the number of parameters in my Gaussian distribution. Now, and these are some side notes. So since we're now working with a probabilistic model, we can also adopt a fully Bayesian approach to really select the dimension of my latent space because so far it was always a model choice. So how many M's, how many components am I going to consider? In this Bayesian setting, we can automate this process of selecting M. And similar to what we saw with the Gaussian mixture model, which was really the probabilistic discrete uh, latent variable model of, let's say, k-means clustering, this Gaussian mixture model could, have, could be optimized by an expectation maximization algorithm. Now, also now in this continuous probabilistic latent variable model, we can also exploit a, a particular expectation maximization algorithm. Though now this is not really necessary because we have closed solutions to our uh, final probabilistic model, um, which we extensively does discussed just now. Um, but sometimes it is actually convenient to resort to this expectation maximization uh, algorithm. Okay, so that wraps it up for principal component analysis. So far we covered really three views. So we, either we said we want to find this lower dimensional subspace. And if we project on it, then I want to preserve maximal variance. Or we said, okay, um, I want to be able to reconstruct my uh, original data points from this lower dimensional space. And I want to minimize my reconstruction error. And finally, we covered a probabilistic uh, approach to uh, this continuous latent variable modeling.
Okay, and then we saw several applications. We saw that we could apply PCA for dimensionality reduction. We saw that we could use it for 2D or 3D visualization in the sense that these high dimensional point clouds are very hard to analyze, but if we can make this low dimensional projection, we can actually visualize it. We can use it for compression. We can use it to whiten the data, so decorrelating the features in my data. And this is actually not covered, but we could also use it for denoising, right? In the sense of this minimal reconstruction error, if we discard all the components that we consider to be noise, then we end up with uh, representations that are, well, um, free of that noise. Um, and then finally, like all these three methods uh, were based on linear models, right? So uh, that's, that's the limitation of this current PCA approach. And in the next video, I will briefly give some directions for non-linear probabilistic models or non-linear uh, principal component models, uh, essentially.